Ephesians 1, 15. For this reason, because I had heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in your knowledge of him, having... Circle eyes, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, circle enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power, circle power, toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Underline verse 22. And he has put, God has put all things under his feet, under Jesus' feet, and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Wow. Now that's a couple of great verses. If I was to ask you, if someone were to speak about your life, what would be the phrases they would use? If someone were to write your obituary when you died, what would be the points of reference they would use to fill in your information, basically the synopsis of your life. Because I want to talk about something for the next few moments here that may change your life, and it's this idea. If God is in your heart, if the Holy Spirit truly dwells in your heart, if you're truly a Christian, if you're truly a follower of God, what difference is it actually making in your life? So there's a phrase, you know, if, if being a Christian was illegal, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And so this idea of what does it mean to belong to God, and if I do belong to God, how does that actually affect the way I live? And does it affect it enough that it's so obvious that others see it in me? So let's look at it this morning. Number one, if you got your notes, number one is, if you're a believer, you can know God's hope. You can know God's hope. Ephesus, so the book of Ephesians was written to a city called Ephesus. That's why it's called Ephesians. Ephesus was a Roman city that drew from the best human wisdom, being deeply influenced by Greek philosophy. So Ephesus... Uh, all the, some of the great philosophers from Rome and from um, Athens would roll through Ephesus. They had one of the greatest libraries of ancient history. They had a massive repository of, of, of human learning. We, even to this day, 2,000 years later, 2,500 years later in, in respects to some of the, the philosophers, we still quote from some of those guys to this day. And so they had access to some of the most intelligent people that have walked the globe. So they were super educated, and they were wealthy, and they had access to great technology in their day. So they were a city, really, you could call it Temecula. You could call it Marietta. This is the book to Marietta. This is the book to Teme Temecula. Keep working your way inland, not so much, but it, <laughs> right here at the corner of the 215 and the 15, this is a quintessential peak at really our society that we live in. Ephesus was just like here 2,000 years earlier. Before the Ephesians had heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus, they believed that they saw reality clearly, but they were actually spiritually blind. Now listen, for many of us, 
we would say, I'm a Christian. And if somebody said, Why, what do you mean by that? What do you mean when you say you're Christian? Well, I, I, uh, I voted uh, Republican and Independent the last couple of elections. And uh, I go to church every once in a while. Uh, I didn't cheat on my taxes too bad this year. Uh, you know, I would consider myself a Christian. Okay. So if, if somebody that's not a Christian does so, those same exact things as you just did, what's the difference between you and the, and the, not, and the atheist guy? Um, I'm not, um, not, not too sure what you mean. No, you know what I mean. You just said the things that exemplify he's a Christian. If those same things are done by the atheist guy, agnostic guy, if those same things are done both the, the same way, what does it really mean to be a Christian? I, I, I don't know. Paul actually tells us right here, and it might blow your mind, because I'm going to give you a different version of Christianity than you may have ever even, even heard. The Ephesians thought they saw reality clearly, but they were actually spiritually blind. And many of us think we are followers of God, but God hasn't changed our heart. He hasn't made us new. We don't act any differently than we did before we knew Christ, so to speak. And so we think we see things because we're smart clearly. Because we're well-educated, we think we see reality clearly. And that's exactly what the Ephesians thought they saw was, we're smart, we make a lot of money, and we got technology that's kind of making our lives easier. But what they didn't realize is that they didn't have spiritual vision. It's one thing to have physical vision and say, I see things pretty clearly. It's a totally different thing to say, I see what God sees. Because before I knew Christ, I went to church. I was a pretty good kid. I did good things. I, I said, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of God. And most people would have said, I believe that. The only problem was, is I had never repented of my sin. I had never come to Jesus. My life was never transformed. Because I lived in America as a Christian or because I was a good person as a Christian or whatever. It's a bunch of non-true things. So wait a second. What do you mean? Time out. What do you mean by Christian then? I'm going to tell you. There's a, there's a point in your life, or if, if, if this is true of you, there was a point in your life this happened. If this hasn't happened yet, then you, you haven't started following God. But there's a point in, in all of our lives where if we are following Jesus, that G, we repented of our sin and Jesus transformed our heart. It literally talks about the Holy Spirit coming inside of your heart. I call it your wanter. Has God changed your wanter? What do you mean by wanter? I mean... The things you want, you want those things because your wanter wants them. And you're born, listen, you're born with a wanter. It's your will. It's the thing inside of you that goes, I want that. I have a deep desire to go do that thing. That's what your wanter is. It's the wanting of life. And you know what's weird is sometimes you don't even know that you want something until it, you want it. You're like, wow, that, that was never a struggle for me before. But all of a sudden I get up in the morning, it's like, wow, all of a sudden it's like, I want that. You're like, where does this even come from? It comes from your heart, your will. And if it's not, listen, if it's not aligned to God, it's going to go chase a bunch of stuff that'll draw you away from God. Listen to me. If your wanter isn't changed by God, you're going to want things that, that, that God doesn't want for you. It's the desires of your heart. It's the thing that makes you go, you know the reason I live? is actually to make more money. Because I know, man, if I made more money, man, I'd be a lot happier than I am. Because I'd buy that thing, and that thing would make my wanter super happy. In fact, my wanter would stop wanting if I just got what I wanted. <laughs> Here's the problem. is you start collecting junk, cars and another house and another wife or whatever, you start collecting stuff, and you realize, I'm not happier. I just got more stuff that I have to insure and pay for and pay taxes on. And what's weird is, all of a sudden you wake up, it's the reason we call it a midlife crisis in the United States. Did you know that most of the world doesn't have a midlife crisis? Guys in Uganda at 40 don't go, what's my life about? Because they're out there just trying to make a meal out of corn. But you know what's weird in, in the United States because we are so obscenely wealthy, we get all this stuff and by the time most, especially for men, they go, no, I did it. And then you realize, now I don't have nothing that matters. And I need to go buy a Corvette. 
Now my wanter will be happy. The point I'm making to you is your wanter will never get enough to make your wanter stop wanting. Unless God changes your wanter. When God changes your wanter, which is what I'm talking about, not, not saying I went to church a couple times and I, I don't do bad things and I'm a Christian. What I'm saying is God comes inside your heart and changes what you want. Then all of a sudden, your whole life changes. If that hasn't happened to you, my, my encouragement to you is repent of your sin and come to know Jesus and become a real follower of God. Stop going to church. Stop playing games. Become a, go to church because you're actually a Christian, because you love God, because your wanter has changed. Once they became believers, the Holy Spirit took residence in their heart and gave them eyes, quote unquote, that were enlightened to comprehend spiritual things. So look in your Bible, Ephesians 1, 18, having the eyes of your heart enlightened. So the book of Ephesians was written in Greek originally 2,000 years ago. That was the common language, like English is the common language of the world today for, for, uh, for business. So Ephesians was written in Greek. You know what that word is, in, that word enlightened is in Greek? It's photizo. You know what word in English we get out of photizo? Photo. So when you look at an old photo of grandma or whatever in black and white, you know the only reason you can see that picture is because light is on it? Do you know your eyes have no ability to pick up something that has zero light? Everybody still with me? Okay. You, have, you don't have radar like a bat or whatever. You can't figure out what something is unless there's light. Fotizo is the idea that light gives you something so that you can see something. It's the reason we have a photo. Lights on something, the, the sunlight's on it, a, a, pic, a picture's uh, enlightened by a, um, a light bulb. Even your phone, you pull it out and you look at Twitter or the news or whatever, the whole screen of glass is lit up from behind. You need light to see. And the idea here is that fatizo is the idea that unless the Holy Spirit comes in your life, you think you have vision, but you actually are blind. And you know what's weird? If you were born blind, you wouldn't have any idea that everybody else isn't blind. If you're born blind, this is the world to you, right? I have friends, like I talked about my neighbor a couple weeks ago. He was, he, was, he was blind. And unless somebody with sight comes and goes, bro, you're blind. You have no idea. You're like, you think everybody, you think the world runs the way that you see it, which is nothing. But a blind person actually is helped by a person with sight when they come and go, hey, you're going to walk off a cliff, bro. Back up. And then all of a sudden, the blind person goes, oh, there's a lot of stuff about this world that I don't know because somebody with vision has helped me. And that's the exact same thing spiritually. Many of us, before we came to Christ, we thought we saw the world correctly. But man, when Jesus changed our heart, all of a sudden, the light come on and we're enlightened. We see what God sees now rather than just what we want. One of these ways of having God work in your life was, that, was the hope that comes from knowing God. The Ephesians had wealth, education, and technology, but at the end of it all, had no hope in the present or hope for the future. Listen to me. Hope without God is no hope at all. You want to know what sucks about life? Is when you run out of hope. You want to know what happens when you run out of hope? Listen to me. You know what happens when you run out of hope? Is you go to, to uh, something to numb the pain, to realize my life is valueless. If you lose hope as a, as a, as a person, as a human being, watch what happens. You lose, the, you, you lose the, the ability to think tomorrow will be better than today if today's really, really bad. If you lose that ability, here's what you do. Is you go find something that'll give you some value for the present. And when that runs out, you, you move into despair. So you're like, I'm super lonely. Uh, I'm running out of hope. I'm, I'm gonna go sleep with a guy or a girl or whatever. At least for that moment, I'll feel like somebody cares. I'll feel, you know, I'll feel close to somebody. I'll feel that, that moment of connection with someone. But man, after that sexual, you know, contact's over, you kind of go, man, I feel like dirt about myself. I feel trashy. I just feel, I feel gross. But in the moment, it seemed right. My wanter wanted that thing. But man, after that, the wanter kind of drifts away and is, I, I'm left with the wreckage of my choices. Or you go to the bottle and you go, man, if I could just get drunk, I would, you know, I like myself better when I'm, when I'm high or when I'm drunk and I just, I don't have to think about stuff. And what happens is, watch, once that thing doesn't 
provide you with a moment of, of joy or, or how you would view value, you immediately go to despair. And you go, okay, drugs and alcohol ain't doing it. Sex ain't doing it. Money ain't doing it. Cars ain't doing it. Popularity on my Facebook page or, or Twitter followers ain't doing it. I literally have no reason to live till tomorrow because I have no hope that tomorrow's gonna be any better than today because right now, today, I can't even get happy. And you go, you know what? I'm going to drink myself to death. I'm going to jump off a bridge. I'm going to kill myself, whatever. That's why those thoughts come into your head. If you, listen to me, humans are built to have hope. If you run out of hope, you literally will go, I'm, I quit living. And so God, in his word, tells us, you need the hope of God. When your wanter changes, you will sense the hope of God in your heart. It doesn't mean all your problems will go away. You'll still have physical problems, mental problems, emotional problems. You know, there'll, there'll still be problems, but here's the difference. You don't have to go chase something else to numb it, to move on. You can go chase God, and God will give you hope to go, we're going to get through this together. We're going to get through this, this lonely time. We're going to get through this financial difficulty. All of a sudden, you have hope. If you don't have hope, man, you have nothing. Let me give you an example. So this morning, I got up before first service. I d actually, I didn't get up after first service. I was up early this morning. <laughs> and uh, I have a dog at home, 94-pound boxer. And I've s told stories about Samson before. But he, if you don't know what a boxer is, it's a breed of dog. And basically, the boxer breed of dog, he's a large, muscular, bully breed and um, if you don't know much about uh, the boxer personality, they're hypersocial. They want to be near you. They're slobbery, and they're just they're 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 dumb as a box of rocks. They're kind of the ADD children of the dog world. Like they just kind of go nuts. But the only problem is they don't have intelligence either. So they're the kind of spasticky. I'm dumb and I'm here. Kind of. Like person in your life where you go, I'm really glad Greg's here, but I wish he wasn't around so much. Like those kind of people. That's what, that's what Samson is. Just the best breed of dog if you like hypersocial hyperactivity. So this morning, I hear, I hear the same thing I hear almost every morning for the last nine and a half years is this. It's his paw on my bedroom, my closed bedroom door. So I get up this morning like I have for years open the door, there's Samson. You, and he's just like this. <laughs> I mean, like for a boxer, every day is Christmas, which is, which is great. You're like, I can't wait. Oh my gosh, what's the, are the presents here? Is everybody here? I can't believe it. <laughs> and so I go, I go, hey. You know, I, and I talk to him, right? I talk to my dog and I go, hey, are you ready to go eat? Are you ready to go eat some breakfast? He's like, oh, oh man, oh man. And he's got these long jowls and, these, oh, and, and in a little while, these long strings of slobber are coming out because he's thinking about this glorious meal he's going to have. True story. So I go downstairs and Samson just sprints downstairs and he runs to the door of our garage from inside. And he, so he's, he's standing there like this because we, we've done this for nine and a half years together. And I open the garage door, and he's like, he's like this, oh, oh, oh. And I go, to the, I go to this box of dog food in the garage, and I scoop some dog food out. And I walk back in the house, and he's like, this. I mean, he's like doing jump spins like this. I can't wait to get this food. And so I go to the back door where we feed him outside, and I, I, you know, I let him outside, and he sprints outside, and he runs to his dog bowl. And I'll pour the dog food in there. And he looks up at me like, Dad, you're the best. Thank you for this amazing meal. And here's the reality of it. I bought 50 pounds of the trashiest dog food you could ever buy from Costco. And I put it in a box in our garage, which is, you know, who knows what temperature that is and who knows what gets into the dog food in the, in the garage. So I'm feeding him the worst, lowest grade trashiest kibble food a person could feed a dog. But to him, I mean, I might as well have taken him to the gambling cowboy or something. <laughs> I mean, he's like, this is the best day ever. Here's the difference. The difference is my dog has no discernment. 
My dog has no discernment. If I was to take him to the gambling cowboy all the time, he, you know, to a steakhouse or something, Ruth's Chris or whatever, he would, he would sit down and go, I don't want that crappy dog food. What do you, I want this. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to eat this. The thing is, he has no discernment because it's what I've always given him. And the other reality is, is that my dog doesn't see tomorrow. He's just happy that he's getting something today. My dog is not built for hope. If things go wrong in his life, he has a hurt hip or, you know, somebody, the cat is meowing at him or whatever and he, he's getting all agitated. Like, he doesn't look ahead. He doesn't look ahead at what his, his, his actions do to himself or other people. He'll dig a hole in my yard and I'll light him up like Christmas. He'll irritate me and I'll go, you know, what are you doing? Next time you do that, I'll bury you in that hole. You know, stop that. And he's, <laughs> I mean, just, you know, mindless. But I love my dog. But the thing is, is that here's the difference between dogs and humans. Ready? Dogs can get excited about a, a bucket of kibble because they have no discernment and they have no hope that anything's going to change tomorrow. Why? Because they don't care about tomorrow. They don't even fathom tomorrow. It's different than humans. We know there's a tomorrow. We know there's a future. We know there's a God in our, in our, in our minds, whether we're atheistic or agnostic or whatever. We have to fight against the knowledge that there's a true God and so when things don't go right, when things don't go wrong, we can't get excited about some kibble and go, this is the best day ever because we know that today's horrible and tomorrow might be worse. So my dog doesn't have to worry about hope. He just lives his life as it is because he ha- he's, not, he's not created in the image of God. He has no soul. I'm not going to see him again. He's a dog. He's an animal that I love, but he's not like my son that I love. My son's stamped in the image of God, just like you. The reason you need hope, my friend, and you can't live your life as a dog just living for the moment, my wanter just wants this, and this will make me happy, the reason that doesn't work for me and you is because you are built for more. You are built to live your life for the glory of God, and anything less than that, you will absolutely find despair in. You want to live your life empty? Keep on letting your wanter just want the kibble of the moment. Keep thinking, I'm going to live for now. Because the problem is that we don't want to see tomorrow because, man, what if tomorrow's worse than today? But you know, if you know God, if you're a child of the king, you can trust him with your, all your tomorrows. You can have hope. Why? Not wishful thinking. You have hope because you know the God that knows tomorrow. And in that, you can, you can rest your whole life on Jesus. Because it's not on you, it's on him. God will carry you through your tomorrows. He has the power over death and the future. My dog doesn't worry about it because he's not in the image of God, but you and I are. So my encouragement to you is follow God. Hope in God. God will always get your back. He might, he might not give you everything you want, but I guarantee he probably won't because your wanter wants things that you shouldn't want but he will always get your back because you're his child. Number one, know God's hope. Number two, know God's inheritance. This might surprise you. If you're a believer, you should know God's hope. You don't have to worry about living day to day like a dog. You should know the God that controls all of your future. And number two, as a believer, you can know God's inheritance. Like physical genetics, God has put himself inside the life of the believer. Watch this. And they are now having their father's DNA and are part of his family. So watch. The last couple weeks I talked about one of the pictures of us before we know Christ, BC, before Christ. We lived our lives with our wanters, just wanting stuff. And we were, we were empty and angry and bitter and lost, and blind, and we thought we had everything, and we could see, and we were intelligent, and smart, and amazing. And then all of a sudden, God opened our eyes, and we saw how blind we were, and we go, I don't want these things like I used to. Change my wanter. Now when that happens post-Christ, watch this. You now belong to a new dad. Your spiritual DNA is now new. So you go from wanting things of your flesh to wanting things of God. How many of you guys look like mom and dad? Anybody look like mom and dad in here? If I was to look at family photos, I'd go, wow, you look like dad or whatever. 
You're like, oh, you got dad's nose. Or like, you wish you didn't have dad's nose. You're like, oh, yeah, I kind of do. Or you got that, you know, you got the funky hair. Mom had that funky hair or whatever. You got the, you know, weird colic or whatever. You're like, you got, mom, you got mom's thing going on. So there's, there's DNA that mom and dad gave you. You didn't get a choice of that. You have physical DNA you didn't do anything about. Maybe you can run super fast or jump super high or maybe you can't even get off the ground. Whatever. But guess what? You may not have been able to choose your physical DNA, but you can choose your spiritual DNA. You can choose who you serve. You can choose what you want in life. Because you can always choose what God wants. How can you do that? Because the Holy Spirit dwells inside your heart, which means you have a new daddy. Everybody, Everybody with me? You have a new daddy now. There's a new daddy in town. You may... (laughs) <laughs> so one person's still awake <coughs> that's awesome <laughs> listen listen you didn't get to choose your physical dad you may have had a great relationship with dad not so great relationship but in the end of, at the end of the day it doesn't even matter whether you had a great relationship with dad or not because you know what really matters is that you have a great relationship with your heavenly father you can't do anything about your physical genetics you can do everything about your spiritual genetics when you belong to a new dad he gives you a new spiritual DNA he changes your wanter. Let me illustrate it. So I just sent my son off to uh, California Baptist University, CBU. It's a, hey, well, Lance are up, all right? So I sent him to college about a month and a half ago, right? So Caleb's at college right now. And uh, first time he had really been there, the first time he's been doing school, just left my house to go to college. Well, I know a lot of the professors there at that school. And so... Uh, but Caleb's never met any of them, and they've never met him. So Caleb is staying on campus, and, uh, you know, he's been, he's been on there on campus about a month and a half. I called him a couple weeks ago, and, you know, like a dad, I'm like, hey, how are things going? You know, how's class? You know, finding friends, whatever. He's like, dad, stop being lame. But the, and I go, you know, are you meeting any, you know, the professors or whatever? And he goes, yeah, you know what's really lame? I'm like, What? He goes, I'm like walking around campus and like strangers walk up to me and go, hey, are you Jim Jackson's son? <laughs> you know, I'm like, Caleb's like, nah, like, yeah. He goes, it happens over and over with total strangers I've never met. And here's the thing. When Jesus was putting Caleb together in my wife's womb, he chose to give him some of my physical characteristics as part of his physical DNA. So if, if Caleb, who's 6'3", 205, were to stand next to me, you would go, okay, we don't need a paternity test. We know, we know who dad is, right? And the, the same thing should be true spiritually. Spiritually, you should, people should know who your dad is. There shouldn't be any doubt at work what kind of woman or what kind of man you are. Because everybody looks at you and goes, do you look just like your mom? Or if, everybody, if the whole family lineup is there, you come, do you look just like your dad or whatever? Same thing with spiritually. If, if nobody at work can tell that you're a Christian, I, I often wonder, are you even a Christian? If you've been there for years and nobody would go, dude, I totally know. If I'm ever going to go to church, I'm going to go with her because I know she goes to church. Or I know she's a Christian. If you've, if you've gone there for years and zero people could ever go, you go to, you're a Christian? I have to wonder, do you have dad's DNA in you? Do you spiritually act out what dad has put inside of you? Because physically we do that, but spiritually do we do that? Spiritually, do you act out what dad has given you? As inheritance, as inheritances, are given to children after a parent's death. Watch this. Children are a parent's inheritance while they are alive. Watch, I'm I'm gonna bend your brain for a second. So when I die, my inheritance to Caleb's probably gonna be like a pair of shoes or something. Like Caleb's gonna go, yay, I got a pair of shoes from dad. That's like all my inheritance is gonna be for my son. But watch, while I'm alive, ready? It's gonna, you probably never heard this before. Children are a parent's inheritance while they're alive. And here's what that means. That means that when I die, Caleb's going to get to enjoy whatever I pass on to him. But while I'm alive, I get to enjoy my son. Parents get to enjoy their kids 
eh, while they're alive, <laughs> right? So if you're a parent, right? If you're a parent, there was a great, remember that day you just loved being a parent? It was probably the first day, and then after that, it's been some, you know, roller coaster of whatever. Uh, so in between the best day of being a parent and I want to ad uh, adopt them out for, out of my family, in between those two extremes, there's a roller coaster of parenting. And a parent's joy, listen to me, kids, especially kids that are listening to me or if you're online listening to me, a parent's joy is their kids. You're going to, you know, I loved raising Caleb till he was about two and a half, three years old. Then there was a gap of time <laughs> till about last week. <laughs> when... So I'm no different than you, right? You raise your kids, it's tough. Tough to raise your kids. But here's the thing. Man, I had so much joy in moments of raising my son that my heart was full of joy. Like that was my inheritance. That was my pay. When I die, he's gonna get what I, what I, what I can give him. But pre that, pre my death, man, my enjoyment of my son was was such a, a glorious thing for me at different moments. And let me encourage you, uh, kids, kids, listen to me. If your parents are still alive, love your parents. Be good to your parents. It's tough to raise you. Believe that. <laughs> Be good to mom and dad or whatever, whatever your family scenario is. Be good to them. Kiss mom. If kissing dad's too weird, give him a handshake or a, or a hug or whatever. Like, I still kiss my son. He's 6'3", 205. I'll still walk up and kiss him in public. Dad, dad, wow, no. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. I'm like a barnacle. I just kind of hold on to him, right? <laughs> and kiss my son. I don't care. That's my son. If I want to kiss my son in public, I'll do it. I don't care. I don't care what you think. I don't care what anybody thinks. You know, I don't know why. Because I love my son. And it brings me great joy to love my son. That's my inheritance while I'm alive. He's not going to give me anything. I will give him things when I'm dead, but pre that, man, the joy of my heart is to be with my kid, even when it's tough. So kids, don't make it as tough as it needs to be. Wow. Okay, yes. That's what I'm talking about. And here's the same thing. Let me extrapolate that now into spiritual things. Listen to what I'm saying. You, when you come to know Christ, when he changed your wanter, when the Holy Spirit comes inside your heart and you get dad's DNA now as a man or woman of God, all of a sudden, watch, you are now God's great joy. You are his inheritance. God needs nothing. This is going to blow your mind. God built the whole universe. He needs nothing. He's built awesome planets that you can't even figure out like Saturn and Neptune. And poor Pluto got, got jacked. He got kicked out. He got kicked out of the solar family. But guess what? God builds everything. He put quasars on the other side of the universe you'll never even see. Glorious things. So amazing. It blows our minds how, they're even, how they even exist. And you want to know what's crazy? At some point, God's going to burn the whole universe. But you know the thing that will last forever is you. You know what God's great joy is? Not stuff. God's great joy is you. you, are, if you once you belong to him, you are his great joy. You're his son or you're his daughter. You are truly a child of the king. There's no greater joy to God's heart than when you obey him. And there's no greater heartache to God, your dad, than when you disobey, when you go back to your old wanter. Because he put the Holy Spirit inside of you to give you a new wanter, to give you a new dad, to give you new desires. Similarly, God's people are his inheritance, both now as he dwells in them, and after death, when, people, when his people will dwell with him, believers will both receive an inheritance from God in eternity and will be an inheritance to God. Number one, know God's hope. If you don't have hope this morning, I hope that you will sense the hope of God. Number two, as a believer, know God's inheritance. Be a good child of God. Let your wanter change. And number three, I'm going to talk about how your wanter actually changes. Know God's power. Know God's, in, God's inheritance, number two, and know God's power, number three. How can my wanter be different so I can honor God? I'll show you. Before knowing God, people are powerless to permanently change themselves or live lives pleasing to God. So let me, let me be clear. God does not love you more because you vote Democrat or Republican or Independent or not at all. God does not love you more because you 
share a meme on Facebook about how awesome your pastor is, although that's quality. That's a quality thing that you should do. God doesn't love you more. There will never be something you can do for God to have him go, wow, now I love you more. God loves you more right now than he will ever love you in the future than he has ever loved you past. You can't, the maximum amount of love that God could have for you, he already has for you right now. Even if you fail, even if you're awesome, even if you obey, even if you disobey, God continually loves you with the relentless love of a father. He's truly a perfect father. He loves his kids to the maximum amount. Everybody with me? God can't love you anymore than he loves you right now, even when you fail. So let me be clear about that. That's the grace of God. Unmerited give to you. you congratulations, you've got it. That's God's love for us. However, this is how we repay him. With God's residence inside a believer's heart, he provides them with his power to live exceptional, God-oriented lives. Look at um, Ephesians 1.19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his what? Those of you guys have your Bibles open. Immeasurable greatness of what in 19? His power. Circle that. In Greek, you know what that word is? It's dunamis. You know what English word we get out of dunamis? Dynamite. We get dynamite out of dunamis, out of the Greek word dunamis. And dynamite is an explosive that's destructive. Dunamis here dwells inside of you and it's constructive and powerful. Dynamite is, is powerful, destructive. The Holy Spirit inside of you is powerful, constructive. It does positive things for your life with God. So when the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, you have power. You have dunamis. You have new power in your wanter you never had before. Where you wanted to keep on doing your old stuff, your old ways, God now gives you not only new wants, but he gives you the power to do it. The believer now accesses the same power that raised Jesus from the grave, showing themselves now to be true, true children of God. How many of you guys would love to see what your obituary is going to say? What if, what if this happened? What if you woke up tomorrow and you went online, you went to Facebook or whatever, and all of your friends are posting on your page, gosh, I wish you were still here. I'm really going to miss you. And all of a sudden you see all these condolences. Like how much people are going to, how much they're going to miss you. Like, I'm sorry how you died. I wish I could have got this last chance to say how much I, I really appreciated you and your smile and blah, 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 blah. If you could see your obituary, listen to me, what would it say? Wouldn't it be scary to see your obituary? Because who knows what people would say about you people that have worked with you, people that you did business with, friends you played on athletic groups with. Oh, I didn't like working with her at all, man. She, was a, she gossiped like for 20 years straight. I could never tell her the truth because I know it would end up on, in the World Wide Web. I didn't like working with him, man. He was part of a team that kept on ripping the company off and I, didn't, I wanted to get out of his team as, as soon as possible. If people could write your obituary and you could read it, what would it say? Would it say the things of your dad or would it say the things of old you? Would your DNA show dad or would your DNA show fleshy old self? You know what's crazy? Is that it actually happened. And it happened to this guy, Alfred Noble. In 1888, he woke up one morning and was having his breakfast and he opened up the paper. And guess what? It had his obituary in it. He's reading what people thought of his life. And you know what was crazy? Is inside of his obituary, the editor that wrote that called him the merchant of death. You want to know why they called him the merchant of death? Because Alfred Noble created dynamite. And he created dynamite to help mining operations, to blow rock apart so you could get to coal or whatever, diamonds, whatever is inside of there. But here's what happened. He created dynamite, but he immediately went to military use because you could blow up 100 guys without having to kill 100 guys with a bullet at a time. So he, Alfred Noble actually changed the face of modern warfare where you could actually blow up people and cities and cars and with one small thing, you could do massive damage. And so when he, when he theoretically died, you know what the editor called him? The merchant of death. 
This so bothered him, he was a, he was a rich uh, engineer and an inventor. This so bothered him, he gave his fortune away, even post-death, to create something called the Nobel Peace Prize. Listen to me. The Nobel Peace Prize came about because of a fake, uh, a thought of obituary that he thought he would be known for the rest of his life. His life's work would be killing people. He gave his fortune so people that promoted peace and understanding would be recognized. So we have now today the Nobel Peace Prize from that guy who wanted his life's work to be known as a guy of peace, not a guy of destruction. But you know the only reason this happened? It's because some guy thought he died. And you know what, what actually happened? His brother died. But the editor of the paper thought he died. And so he wrote up a whole obituary for a guy that was still alive. And here's what's interesting about that, my friends is if somebody was writing your obituary, the last pieces of what you were known about, would they know your dad? Would your life be so spiritually DNA'd with your dad that people go, he was a man of God. There's a lot of times he could have fudged the edges of his business, but he's, he's, he had integrity. I loved her. She loved people. Never talked behind anybody's back, man. She was solid. She invited me to church. I never really went, but man, I know that she was legit. If you could see your own obituary pre-death, would it exemplify your dad? Does it have dad's DNA on, you, on your life? Because the power you have inside of you is greater than the power of your failure. The Holy Spirit is the dunamis inside of you to give you the power to want the right things. Listen to me. You have the power to overcome the sin in your life. You have the power to overcome your porn habit. You're like, no, I don't, man. It's been years. It's constant. I go online. It's like, that's where I find, that's where I find my connection with, with being alive. The power of God will help you overcome those things. You're, you're not a slave to your old self. You have the power. You have dunamis inside of you. God's word tells us we have that power. You don't have to choose your sin. You can choose God. It's not, it, can be over, it can feel overwhelming, but you don't have to go there. You're like, you don't understand. I gotta just keep taking these vikes because it's where I'm at. I don't have much pain, but these Vicodins make it happen for me. I gotta go back to the bottle. Nobody even knows I drink, but man, I, just, I gotta have that. I feel better when I'm, when I'm kind of stoned. Listen, all of us are addicted to sin. All of us have an addiction, every single one of us. It's a weakness in your life that your wanter goes, I want that. It's your old self that goes, let's go back to the old good days. But you, unlike your pre-Jesus self, you didn't have the power to say no. But scripture says, dunamis has been put inside of you. You have the power to say, nope, I'm living for dad now. I got different DNA. I'm letting go of my past. I'm not going to those websites anymore. I'm not going to those parties anymore. I'm not living that life anymore. I have the power inside now to say no. Why? Because I want to live a life honoring to God. I'm tired of living in trash. Lastly, know God's authority. We can know God's hope. We can know God's inheritance. We can know God's power, the dunamis inside of our heart. And lastly, we can know God's authority. The Ephesians appealed to the authority of magic and the occult to try and control nature or the gods or goddesses like Artemis. So I showed you this a couple weeks ago. This is a picture of Artemis. This is actually found in Ephesus. She was a goddess of fertility and also of the outdoors and nature. And so the Ephesus was actually the home base of the worship of Artemis. And it was the occultic center of worship to her. So if you needed fertility stuff, you'd worship Artemis. You needed your herds to propagate, you'd worship Artemis. You wanted to control nature or something in the wildlife, you'd, you'd worship Artemis. Oftentimes through sexual unions with other people, uh, you'd, give, you'd sacrifice animals. All kinds of stuff would go to worship of her. We do that in our society. Uh, the horoscope, 
We go have our palms read. We go to seances and uh, we check out Ouija boards and try to discern what power is out there for our own use. We want to know the future. We want to know who we should marry. We want to manipulate that guy. We want him to die. And so we ask the power out there to do that thing. And here's the thing. That can all seem like hocus pocus, but in reality, people go after that because there's a true power there. It's demonic. There's a demonic power. Don't think that it's all fun and games. It's not. But here's the reality. The God who built all these things is greater than any power in the world. Why in the world would you seek out people or a psychic or a seance to figure out what your future is going to be when you can go to the God who knows the future? Why would you seek out how the stars are aligned to figure out what your, what your future is going to be when you can go to the God who made the stars? Why would you figure out what day you were born on to see what sign you were born under when God decided the day you were going to be born? Here's the thing. The Ephesians went to the occult to try to figure out what their future held. And Paul tells us, man, not only do you have dunamis inside of you to choose rightly as a woman or man of God, but you don't have to go back to the old ways of trying to figure out what God's about when you can go right to God in his word and it'll tell you exactly who God is. Why go to creation when you can go to the creator? And if psychics were real, they would have already told you you were going to call. They'd call you. Hey, I knew you were going to call. Just thought I'd tell you the future. You shouldn't have to tell psychics your name or your number or your credit card number. They should already know. Okay, moving on. Yet unlike accessing demons or made-up gods, believers can appeal to Jesus who as the Son was given rulership of all things and as God has ownership of all things. As Jesus is the head over everything and especially the church, believers know the true God and will share in his dominion over the universe someday. Ready? I close with this. The highest raises up the least to give them the best. Isn't that glorious? Man, I want to encourage you when you walk out those doors today. You know how much God loves you? He doesn't have to love you at all. He chooses to love you. You're his great joy. He has the whole universe. He doesn't even care about the universe. What he cares about is you. The highest God raises up the least us to give us his best. And you know what that is? That's a mark of a good father. That's a perfect father. Whether you and I had great fathers or not doesn't even matter. Because if you know God is your father, you've got the best. You've got the best. 